Good morning and thanks very much for your patience. Sorry about the late running this morning. I was um, stuck underground for an hour and a half, but I've made it. Um, so thank you for bearing with us. Um, and today we have our long awaited update on EU financial services legislation and associated initiatives. As we're reaching the midpoint of the year, it means it's time for Dr. David Doyle to provide us with his update. We last heard from him um, in early January of this year. So this morning, um, David will be talking about the EU Artificial Intelligence Act, the world's first initiative to comprehensive regulate AI and the Digital Operational Resilience Act, DORA, notably in relation to third-party ICT providers and due diligence. David is known across Europe as a leading expert on EU financial services regulation. He's a former diplomat with over 20 years experience in mainland Europe and he now acts as an EU policy advisor and is a board member and secretary to the Financial Services Working Party of the joint MEP EU industry advocacy body at the European Parliament. He also holds a seat on the board of directors at the Genesis Initiative in Westminster that promotes entrepreneurship and SME policy. Uh, just quickly before I hand over to David, the usual housekeeping points. I'm Charlotte Dorb Rashley and I manage the FS Club at Zen. I'd like to warmly acknowledge our very team responses who enable us to continue to bring you a wide range of thought provoking content across finance, technology and economics. And as usual, we'll put the slides um, on the website and the chat box for you. We'll record the session and it will be available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And of course, we'll be having a 20 minute Q&A with David after the presentation. So please use the uh, chat facility on GoToWebinar to put your questions into me and then I'll feed them into the conversation. Um, now, without uh, further ado, it's um, my pleasure to hand over to you, David. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm glad you were able to make it this morning uh, to open the session. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, over here in mainland Europe, we're still uh, absorbing last week's uh, vote uh, at the European Parliament, which saw a massive shift in populist and far-right uh, parties at the European Parliament, especially from Germany and France, uh, triggering a call by President Macron uh, for a snap national election uh, this month. Uh, these new emerging groups will probably make up about a quarter of the total uh, of the total European parliamentary uh, mandate. Uh, but the uh, European elections have all, were also marked by a, de a very pretty sharp decline in the green parties who have been very prominent at the European Parliament for the last you know 10, 10 years. Nevertheless, the centre-right European Popular Party still holds the leadership in terms of the number of seats. Um, but the overall results of this combined right-tilted group of MEPs uh, taking uh, over the European Parliament from the end of August next will have a profound impact, in my view, in terms of uh, perhaps seeking a general dialing back of the European Union's climate policies and its uh, environmental policy in general. And a lot of expectations from analysts watching this very carefully uh, would probably suggest that one of the areas that will be uh, looked at very seriously is reversing the ban on combustion engines, uh, accompanied by the weakening of the 2035 phase out of sale of all new petrol and diesel cars. So a less, uh, I guess, friendly, climate friendly European Parliament could make life uh, a little bit more challenging for Brussels in terms of uh, the general proposals that were made back uh, a decade ago to pursue a legal target of cutting emissions by 90% by 2040. In other words, the European Parliament, I think we will see a more uh, a shift towards a more realistic climate and decarbonisation uh, ambition. Now, some of this will probably also trigger and certainly it will uh, uh, um, merge uh, some key clarifications on environmental disclosures for uh, important uh, EU legislative packages, notably the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure. Uh, regulation and the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the latter already having been delayed 
uh, which was due to be in place by the end of this year for banks and has now been um, delayed uh, without any future uh, indication of the dates. But much of this shift um, has also been uh, a shift that is to say towards the, the right to center groups uh, has been on the cards for some time and has been heavily influenced by both investors and center right governments across Europe who have expressed vocal concerns about the European Union maybe becoming uh, slightly less competitive compared to the United States and other regions in the world due to overregulation holding back the growth of small businesses and large companies. I think the other area of focus in this new European Parliament and indeed the new incoming European Commission at the end of the year will be the scaling up of the EU digital strategy designed to foster a vibrant community of European uh, innovators, including in the financial sector, while it's at the same time enacting stringent regulations uh, to guard against risks to citizens, investors and the corporate world in general. One prominent legislative package that will certainly get attention is the very recent EU Artificial Intelligence Act, now ratified by the European Parliament and Council, due for implementation uh, and application as early as 2025 in terms of conduct, codes of conduct, and 2027 at the very latest for obligations associated with the so-called high-risk AI applications. So in, in broad terms, this uh, piece of uh, legislation is the first attempt globally uh, to govern uh, AI applications. And in the case of, uh, of Europe, um, it, it is very much becoming a de facto standard for the rest of the world. Uh, it will focus exclusively on risks uh, of usage rather than the applications. And already we're seeing divergent positions vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States, which has a much more pro-business uh, approach to this, and the United Kingdom, uh, which is taking a very different approach as well. Uh, the uh, fundamental characteristics uh, of this piece of the EU legislation is probably twofold. One, creators and originators and manufacturers of AI models will become liable for the use or the misuse, uh, including deepfakes uh, or the uh, crypto, the, the um, infiltration by uh, cyber criminals uh, are on the basis of uh, its use elsewhere. Even if a third party embeds uh, is in a different system, the originator manufacturer, regardless of their origin, will be uh, the person or the company that remains liable for its misuse uh, throughout the, uh, the food chain. The scope covers all um, permutations associated with AI, creators, service providers, deployers, importers, distributors, product manufacturers, but not users per se. And the other, I think, critical um, feature is the extraterritorial uh, dimension that's been introduced into this piece of legislation, not for the first time, I might add, but providers and deployers of AI systems who are established in third countries outside of the EU, um, but where the output is produced by the AI system for use in the EU will fall within the scope. And indeed, uh, the AI Act requires that third country providers or creators of AI systems which are used in the 27 EU or even any one single country of the European Union must appoint an authorized representative established in the EU. So we are seeing some very strong indications of extraterritoriality here. The Act obviously um, has another important, very critical feature in unlike uh, the approach adopted by the US, the United Kingdom, Singapore and elsewhere, a key characteristic uh, is the EU's requirement to subject all so-called high-risk AI systems to pre-training data, which must be examined prior to the AI model being uh, unfolded uh, across the different markets. Now, this is being designed to ensure that the AI model or application, before it's commercialized, before it's operationalized, 
is free of any errors uh, or bias. Um, so this, uh, this characteristic, along with the liability factor, the uh, incredible uh, detailed level of due diligence obligations in the development of the AI system from the very outset, including applications used for targeting legal and natural persons, mechanisms to verify the correctness of decisions, and again, this, this measure holding individuals or originators responsible, accountable, if the decision is found to be incorrect. Next uh, uh, slide, please. So what we um, have is a classification system to which classifies the various levels of risk at the very top uh, end of the uh, risk uh, cycle is the unacceptable uh, risks which are prohibited. And perhaps importantly for the financial services sector, banks, insurers, uh, pension funds, asset managers, it's the high risk area. Not, that's not going to be banned per se, but there are some very strict uh, and very detailed conformity assessments, stringent requirements required in, in this. Uh, next slide. And to give you some idea of what these, um, these uh, areas that the regulators will be looking at in the financial services sector, uh, particularly in the areas like banking and asset management, uh, areas of potential high risk, in my view, uh, which will need to be uh, pre-authorized and tested by the regulators would include things like credit scoring models, the evaluation by banks of the credit worthiness of natural persons in terms of loan origination and decisioning. Secondly, automated insurance claims processing, uh, risk any risk assessment tools in the insurance sector uh, used for setting risk premiums, assessment of, K, of uh, case of life and health insurance, and the, any you know, permutation or uh, poor design at the very outset can obviously result in financial exclusion and or discrimination. And of course, in the provision of investment services vis-a-vis -vis the retail investors, especially retail investors who use chatbots or robo-advisor robo type um, uh, models. So high risk um, financial services AI models are of course permitted, that's not the issue, they're not gonna be banned, but they must be assessed uh, a priori by the regulators at national level, first in terms of the conformity assessment and are required to be registered across the EU in an EU database, which will be up and running by the end of 2027. Again, I emphasize the ultimate responsibility and liability uh, for the misuse uh, so, uh, such as deep fakes or discrimination or uh, financial exclusion to take uh, three uh, pretty high level uh, examples remains uh, with the AI application originator or manufacturer and not with the licensee that may decide to add its own uh, uh, permutations to that. Next slide, please. Clearly, um, this will recall, this will require, and indeed regulators will be calling out for, assigning human oversight, particularly in areas that relate to climate-facing activities, visibly natural persons, uh, where there is going to be need for necessary skills, training, uh, and authority. Monitoring of operations and resilience, and this obviously relates very strongly to the uh, Digital Operational Resilience uh, uh, Act itself, which has been, which has given, been given a massive boost. It's being accentuated uh, very significantly uh, as a result of the introduction of the uh, AI uh, Act. We'll come back to that later. Ensuring that input data is relevant and solid and can be verifiable, and that it's not based only on probability, which is not going to be sufficient, not if you are dealing uh, with important investment decisions by retail investors. Um, carrying out data protection and impact assessments, GDPR obviously is a big, big important area here, and cooperating with national competent authorities in terms of informing them of any deviation uh, from these uh, rules. A number of very specific um, requirements are also introduced uh, for originators and manufacturers of AI systems in the financial services sector uh, in relation to so-called third parties, the licensees. Again, the responsibility lies with the originator, but also, in addition, uh, the EU has introduced that third parties 
uh, must assign their own name or trademark to the AI system uh, so that it's clearly identifiable. Secondly, any modifications to an AI system by a third party should not in any way change the original classification of the AI model uh, if it's already considered to be a high risk AI system. So no dilution or circumvention will be, uh, will be permitted. And last but not least, any modification to a non high uh, risk AI system by a third party, uh, particularly a general purpose AI, should not transpose it into a uh, otherwise high risk uh, application. Again, uh, ensuring that there's no dilution uh, or circumvention of the rules going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so what will the key risks uh, that have been identified uh, by ESMA, by McKinsey and its reports over the last year, what are the key areas of risk that regulators are likely to be looking out for? Well, I would classify them under the, these five headings, explainability, uh, in other words, the transparency, uh, understanding by clients, by customers, by citizens, in terms of how a particular outcome was actually obtained. Was it, prob was it a based on probability or can we have a little bit more uh, uh, certitude? Secondly, a lack of expertise uh, by both within companies, within financial institutions and by supervisors uh, as to how specific EU rules uh, should actually be applied. We're in very, very early stages at the moment. Uh, secondly, data availability, accessibility, quality, protection, etc., hugely important, both in terms of data privacy, security, uh, intellectual property, but also, by the way, um, data usage. Uh, so the, one, of the, one of the areas that has been massively boosted as a result of AI is the, um, is the growth of data centers associated with financial service entities. Uh, something like 70% of European data centers associated with financial institutions are now outsourced sometimes to third uh, countries over which the EU regulators have no control. The concern, at least at this stage, is the massive uh, energy consumption um, a characteristic of many of these data centers. 3% of the global electricity usage is tied up or is attributed to data centers so to a point where certain countries like uh, Ireland and previously Singapore have had to actually uh, intervene and uh, restrict any further construction of data centers. Quite clearly, this is a, going to be a problem. Concentration, systemic risk, very important. Uh, are we reaching a stage where uh, the financial services entities become over dependent on a third party distributor or ICT provider, which is feeding into or supporting uh, the AI infrastructure. So operational resilience uh, could be greatly endangered by uh, the, as a concentration of a small number of ICT, uh, ICT uh, tr uh, uh, providers, as it were, uh, both within and outside the EU to a point where if there is a, a failure of any one of these um, ICT providers, it could have serious ramifications in terms of the continuity of important critical functions within banks, insurance, insurance companies, etc. Obviously, we have bias that has been mentioned uh, uh, quite a bit, the representative representationalness of the data, the bias and the fairness the factual inaccuracies, how these will be uh, picked up quickly. Again, the need for human intervention and potential copyright and IP infringements, which is holding back quite a bit of the uh, many financial institutions from going uh, any further. And of course, you have the operational risks. And under the operational risks, I would cite a number of important issues which are already occurring uh, in the financial services sector, malicious actions like theft and fraud, for instance, uh, recently um, we had a case in the UK of a leading UK engineering company which lost 25 million US dollars in uh, false uh, transfers to a company in Hong Kong due to fraud fraudsters using a digitally cloned hyper-realistic video of a senior manager who was requesting transfer of funds on a video call. 
before it was discovered, 25 million um, US dollars was already spent and it was picked up rather late in the day. There are also cybercrime issues, uh, particularly as we move more and more to cloud uh, applications, which are super uh, charged by AI, um, where cyber criminals are now getting much more proficient in terms of injecting false information into AI large language models of generative AI systems, which are used by banks to, for the large part, injecting therefore normal financial transactions as fraudulent and vice versa, which results, of course, in AI models learning to classify these models incorrectly. Uh, there have been cases of bank fraud in South um, uh, Africa, for instance, back in 2016, where as a result of AI uh, super terrible, supercharged um, uh, cloud uh, models, a cyber attack stole something like 13 million US dollars of um, uh, credit card uh, payments, um, which uh, were uh, which were not being uh, adequately protected uh, against uh, against fraud. Next slide, please. Um, so Dora, Dora obviously has a particularly important uh, uh, in, important uh, implication for uh, AI. It really means that all financial institutions, indeed, regardless of the introduction of AI. Uh, need to ensure that all of the third party uh, ICT providers are um, uh, robust, that they don't suffer from concentration, that they're not servicing the same number uh, of financial institutions, that in the event of a failure or outage, the implications, the adverse implications, not just in terms of reputation, but economic uh, losses uh, could be huge. And indeed, the DORA legislation provides for some very uh, well-defined areas of um, uh, outage and failure of ICT uh, providers and how uh, financial institutions need to be able to identify serious levels of um, uh, in instances uh, within the ICT uh, function. Uh, so what we're really looking at here is ICT third party providers. And again, most of mainland Europe financial institutions are massively outsourcing their ICT functions. Uh, in, and I just mentioned earlier, 70% of databases uh, from most banks, for instance, are already outsourced uh, to third party providers. Now, the problem the Commission has with all this, and indeed analysts, is that certain ICT third party providers, A, there are very few of them, so you have this concentration uh, risk, the over reliance on a small number of ICT providers. And should there be a failure, it could have huge implications. So uh, we're already talking about, you know, um, uh, or asking the question uh, is my ICT provider systemic? Uh, should we be taking uh, the necessary measures? Indeed, you will have to take measures in re, uh, reviewing and renegotiating with all of your ICT providers um, the uh, terms uh, of the agreement to, to comply with the DORA legislation. But within the house, uh, within house, as it were, from banks, insurers, asset managers, uh, the new DORA uh, application, which comes into place on the 17th of January 2025, will rely on uh, well-documented ICT management uh, frameworks, policies, procedures, uh, guidelines, proposals, protocols, which need to be very, very uh, detailed and uh, would need to be um, also auditable by, uh, by the regulators. Reporting on any major ICT related um, instances, including cyber threats, and also introducing in house digital operational uh, resilience testing, both in house and vis a vis your ICT third party provider. Now, this is a, a major departure from you know, the way ICT function uh, operated in the past. And it means that, you know, vis a vis all of the ICT third party providers. There is a need, there is an obligation on the part of all financial institutions, no exceptions, to access, to assess the preparedness of handling ICT related incidents, both in-house and vis-a-vis -vis your third party uh, providers. 
identifying weaknesses, deficiencies, gaps, and digital operational resilience um, gaps, as it were, uh, both in-house and with third-party providers. And this must be conducted on a yearly basis. Now, importantly also, is the need for um, each financial institution to actually assign the ultimate responsibility and accountability for digital operational resilience at a fairly senior level reporting to the board. Uh, also developing uh, strategies, which goes without saying, and creating a, a, an enhanced and unified uh, internal framework to deal with ICT risk. So this is not just about financial services, but human resources, supply chains, uh, you, uh, and a range of other uh, issues where ICT uh, providers are involved. So it has to be a, a comprehensive, holistic approach to the entire uh, to the entire operation. Next uh, slide, please. So the the other I think important factor to bear in mind is that EU firms um, uh, will not be authorized to use non-EU critical ICT third-party providers that uh, are operating outside of the EU. Yes, again, another example of uh, uh, extraterritoriality. Again, it only relates, though, to critical uh, third-party ICT providers. Those, for instance, were the systemic impact in the terms of the provision of services to financial entities uh, could be seriously compromised if the ICT provider were to fail. Uh, equally, um, the number rely over reliance on the number of uh, financial entities on, let's say, three or four, maybe five key ICT providers in the same region uh, is also seen as being a big vulnerability factor. And therefore, the uh, big, um, the three, the three uh, EU regulators, ESMA, EBA, and EOPA, will have the powers uh, to be able to designate which ICT provider is considered to be critical. In other words, it's critical should there be a failure on the part of that ICT provider, uh, it could have huge ramifications in terms of critical ICT and uh, other um, functions within the bank, insurer, insurance company, or asset management company. The lead regulator that for critical ICT providers who are now going to be brought within the scope and regulated as if they were also systemically uh, important will fall to the EBA, EOPA, uh, or ESMA, who can seek information about um, uh, policies of the ICT providers uh, at their will. They can audit if they so wish. They can temporarily suspend partly or completely the use or deployment of a designated ICT provider. So some huge implications here. And obviously, this has become accentuates the problem if the ICT providers are based in a, a non-EU uh, jurisdiction over which the EU regulators have no control. So uh, DORA must be introduced um, by the 17th of January. Next slide, please. Just to conclude, um, the question of materiality comes into designating which, uh, uh, which threshold should an incident by at a bank or insurance company, asset management company, be considered to be significant, uh, which would trigger a, a number of interventions by the regulators? Well, the DORA legislation indeed brings uh, all of this to the surface by classifying instances in terms of the number of clients affected, reputational damage, geographical spread, data losses, and also the economic losses uh, where they are likely to exceed 100,000 euros. But on that note, let me uh, let me pause and hand you back to Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I think it'll be very key to get you back um, in six months' time to see how all this is working in practice. Um, going back to the AI, so obviously, Developers need to build safeguards um, into this against against misuse, right? That would that's yeah. what the the onus is on them. Um, and we've got a few questions around that. So Nikki has asked, um, who at the provider company is actually liable, and what will the fine or punishment be? Yeah. Um, well, let's give you a very specific example of the fines. Um, um, 
it's been largely reported that the EU has already fined one major big uh, tech company uh, over poll disinformation that happened, I think, um, la last month. Uh, but under the Digital Services Act, which is now operational, uh, the EU uh, can fine up to 6% of the global turnover of a big tech company. And these big tech companies could also be uh, providers of ICT services. In particular, if uh, there is um, misinformation or disinformation and or deep fakes, like the case uh, recently that I cited of a UK engineering company that lost 25 uh, million US dollars in transferring uh, money uh, falsely on the basis of deep fake um, uh, to, to a Hong Kong uh, client. Um, so the implications are huge, 6% of, um, of global turnover. Who's responsible? Um, well, it, it's the institution that's responsible, not necessarily the individual. It's the financial institution, the, the bank, the asset manager, the insurer, uh, uh, and not necessarily, and I, I would emphasize this, not necessarily the licensee, not the, the plethora of brokers or dealers or intermediaries uh, that ha have um, uh, adopted the license, as it were, uh, and are using it and maybe have misused it, transformed it into a super high risk AI model when actually at, the, at, the, uh, at its origin, it was considered not to be non uh, non. Uh, uh, it was considered to be non high risk. So the responsibility again lies with the originator, manufacturer, there, and it's the institution. It's that institutional level rather than individual uh, senior management level uh, per se. Well, hopefully that works as a big enough um, deterrent. Uh, Philip has asked if there are any implications uh, from the recent European parliamentary election uh, for FS regulation. Well, no, I think what this new parliament will do, it will, um, uh, it will uh, maintain the emphasis of the EU digital strategy, well, which was devised back in, in 20, uh, 20, 20, 2021. Uh, as a means of boosting uh, financial, uh, the financial sector, um, ensuring that customers and clients and investors have access, digital access to uh, a wider range of uh, investment uh, assets, et cetera. Uh, also reducing the costs uh, and the burdens associated with the, the administration a uh, processing of transactions of settlement and dealing and so on. All of that, uh, I think, is will still remain a key priority. And indeed, the European Union is making enormous strides in this area. Where I think they will also, though, give more emphasis, though, is in addressing some of the downsides to the uh, EU AI Act, notably in areas like disinformation, bias, discrimination, deep fakes, uh, the use of uh, AI uh, to deal uh, with um, uh, uh, cr uh, crime, cyber crime, um, which can make things uh, very, very challenging for, for banks and insurers. Uh, so I think they'll be looking at ways of uh, institutionalizing um, some of the guidance that we have at the moment, because all we have is guidance at the moment in terms of what uh, banks and insurers should be doing. Uh, but clearly, um, Another area that they will be looking at, uh, because the uh, responsibility for policing the AI Act actually lies primarily with national regulators. They're the ones who have to assume the responsibility for the interpretation uh, and more importantly for the, um, uh, for the pre-authorization based on an assessment done by, by the regulators. The question will arise. Uh, do the regulators in Europe, um, outside of the very, very large uh, sovereign states that have well-established, seasoned uh, regulatory agencies, what about the other small to medium-sized uh, country regulatory agencies? Do they have the capacity, uh, institutional capacity, to be able to undertake such a massive exercise? And I think the, the new parliament will probably want to 
uh, get involved fairly early uh, in, in institutionalizing some of the guidance that's been provided in, in looking for ways to uh, unify and harmonize some of the pre-approval assessment mechanisms uh, and ensuring that the you know that there is a, a reasonable level of dialogue also with uh, the AI uh, application originators and manufacturers. That's critically important. I think this is going to see a massive shift uh, towards more collaborative approach with the AI um, manufacturers and originators to work out solutions that are in everybody's interest. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good thing. Um, Cullum has asked if this technology regulation um, will keep up. So he's me he's mentioned here using the example of ESG, saying that ESG, you know, everyone was on board with that for a while, but that seems to have faded before achievement of the end goal. Um, yeah. And he's wondering if this will be the same with AI regulation. Um, is is it at risk of being eclipsed eclipsed before it's fully in implemented? No, uh, it, it, as far as the ESG um, strategy and agenda is concerned, no, no, I mean, it, it will, I, I mentioned earlier on that, you know, we will see a certain dialing back of the EU's very ambitious uh, decarbonisation and environmental um, uh, ambitions. Uh, there's no question about that. That's already been on the cards for quite some time, if for nothing else, because uh, it, certain governments and analysts, investors see this as being uh, slightly over an over-regulated uh, eurozone region, which makes uh, industry uncompetitive compared to the rest of the world. But this doesn't mean that the EU is going to walk away from important pieces of legislation. And I mentioned the two already, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation uh, and the EU uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Now, these will no doubt be subject to further clarification, there may be more delegated acts, there's a lot of issues that still need to be worked out. Financial institutions are still struggling, uh, A, because of the lack of um, you know, compelling data, but also in terms of interpretation, notably in the field of the taxonomy regulation. You know, what constitutes a perfect uh, environmental uh, ESG friendly uh, economic activity under Article 9 compared to Article 6. Uh, and I think there's need and there will be a need for further clarification, further guidance, at least on in the initial stages, in terms of all of the existing legislation. But they're not going to be taken off the, um, uh, the, legal, uh, the legal books. They're going to remain in place. There will be, I think, delays, as I've mentioned already, particularly for the corporate sustainability reporting directive, which is largely designed for corporations, commercial uh, corporations in manufacturing and services industry. It wasn't designed for the financial services sector, and hence the reason for a slight delay uh, for implementation and application of this, re of this um, directive. Most, it's actually an implementation of the directive by the end of this year because of some of the, um, the challenges that are being faced by financial institutions in terms of the so-called dual materiality uh, disclosure feature, which is very, very, very detailed. So yes, I, I think we will have a, um, a general um, uh, scaling back of some of the ambitions, uh, making it more realistic, but at the same time, um, making the existing legislative uh, framework more user-friendly, uh, more transparent, uh, and giving financial services industry time to actually adapt themselves to the, these new regimes. Okay, thank you. Um, Kairos, I probably I pronounced your name wrong, apologies. Um, he's asked if um, Dora is expected to impact practically every, every major organization, not only financial institutions. Um, and if yes, like how many organizations engage in significant procurement payments utilizing payment processes? And um, how would they be affected in practical term, terms by DORA? Okay, well, uh, DORA um, uh, leaves no financial institution uh, excluded from this piece of legislation. It is a very, very comprehensive, holistic piece of legislation. It includes payment, uh, uh, payment systems, uh, uh, operators, banks, insurers, uh, crypto asset uh, service providers. It includes 
everybody. There's, there, there are no exceptions to that rule. And that, by the way, also includes uh, intermediaries. Uh, who uh, provide um, services um, between the banks, insurers, and the and the clients? Um, yes, there are other non-financial service sectors that are going to be affected at a later stage. Uh, the Dora was largely designed for the financial services sector, but there are going to be clearly um, a read across implication for other strategic vulnerable sectors of the economy. Uh, energy, uh, a good example gas infrastructures, nuclear uh, energy, electricity, uh, telecoms, um, to, and, and the healthcare sector. Uh, all of this in time will be covered under uh, a DORA uh, type um, framework with the regulators on each of these sectors taking a role in, in policing this. But as far as payment systems uh, providers are concerned, yes, they are included. Uh, uh, and, and very much a focus of regulators' attention in terms of um, uh, uh, instances that occur uh, in the provision uh, of payment services. Thank you. Um, on that note, um, Stephen's asked, what will happen to firms who can't comply, especially because they rely on third-party critical services? Well, they really, they're not going to have much of a choice. Uh, the 17th of January, 2025, we're not very far away from that. Um, and I've always said to people who ask this question, you need to stop now. Um, part of the problem I have is, I, I, anecdotally, I think a lot of financial institutions are not ready for DORA. Um, a lot of them are uh, treating this in a very silo fashion, whereas it's a much more holistic financial uh, uh, institutional wide issue that needs to be dealt with uh, on an institutional uh, level uh, by setting up necessary working parties, by starting already to uh, open a collegial um, open dialogue with your key third party uh, ICT providers who no doubt will also be aware of DORA. It's not that they are, aren't already aware of, they will be aware of it, but the, you know, the critical issues will be Will, will come to the light, to the surface very quickly. You know, will you want to continue working with your current or some of your current ICT providers if they're not even prepared to have a dialogue on things like on-site um, in investigations by you as a financial institution as to the resilience of their ICT systems, governance arrangements, uh, do they have a winding down procedure should the you know should the ICT provider fail a bit like a bank? Uh, do they have a a a, um, a a measure in place to ensure that services can be restored within 48 hours? Uh, so there are some important immediate issues that need to be uh, tackled. Um, and again, it'll be mid 2025, maybe even a bit later before um, national regulators and more importantly uh, the uh, the EBA, ESMA and EOPA start to question major financial institutions about the uh, resilience of their ITC systems, whether they've undertaken the necessary due diligence vis-a-vis -vis their current range of ICT providers, what was, what was the outcome, have they renegotiated all the uh, arrangements, the deals, the contracts with these um, ICT providers? Because this is what is going to be required, is a new paragram in terms of contractual arrangements, which must be super, super DORA compliant. Uh, and that means uh, taking into account um, issues that uh, up to now, um, many financial institutions didn't have to worry about. It was uh, an outsourced uh, function uh, being handled uh, uh, very competently and professionally, but now Dora has stepped in to ask what if there's a failure, particularly if it adversely affects critical, uh, important, inverted commas as defined by the EU, critical and important functions within the uh, bank or the insurer, treasury, uh, accounts payable, uh, uh, client payment systems, uh, clients access to their bank accounts. If that goes, go, if there's a, an outage 
of more than 48 hours, you know, under DORA, you will find yourself facing some challenges uh, with the with the regulators. So yeah, I mean, um, I think the question really should be, when do we start to uh, open a collegial uh, and frank dialogue with all of our ICT providers uh, in order to identify those there, those gaps, those deficiencies, and ensure uh, that the ICT provider is indeed resilient from mm. uh, uh, governance, ICT perspective, uh, and can continue to provide services, unfettered um, access to services uh, without uh, major uh, uh, instances occurring. And we should be doing this right now. And um, we should be doing right. this right now. <laughs> uh, we've got time for one last question. Um, apologies if we haven't got to yours today, but we will definitely send them on um, to David, and he's usually very kind at getting back to back to people. Um, so this will become increasingly important. What insurance is available for these potential issues at the user level? What insurance is available? Yeah. I'm not sure I can answer that. I I, I don't think um, I, I don't think many financial institutions have have gone that far in the thinking. The thinking right now is, uh, you know, are we going to be compliant by the 17th of January 2025, uh, and that we need to start now uh, reviewing existing contracts, uh, opening a dialogue with the ICT providers, identifying gaps, deficiencies, and also internally. Um, beefing up and scaling up, uh, you know, our own internal document uh, ICT strategy in terms of protocols, guidance, uh, signing off procedures. Have we already designated a key ICT uh, stroke data uh, director at a reasonably senior level to be able to ensure uh, institutional wide uh, application and compliance with DORA? They are the, for me, are the critical questions. Thank you. Um, and just before we wrap up, we had an um, entertaining question from Simon who's asked, how can we tell if this is the real Dr. Um, David Doyle or are you a deep fake? <laughs> how do we know? <laughs> I'll leave that to your guess. Good question. Good uh, question. Thank <laughs> you. Um, it's been lovely to uh, catch up and pick your brains once again, thank David. You. Um, you've thank provided you. another thorough and insightful presentation. Um, thank you also to everyone for being so patient and staying in the webinar and for your um, inquisitive questions and contributions. And also thanks again to our sponsors for making these webinars possible. Don't forget to check out the forthcoming events on our website. We have uh, an in-person event on Tuesday next week, which is focusing on the literary history of the city instead of the financial. I think there's a few spaces left if you want to register for that one. It would be great to meet more people in person. And David, I look forward to catching up with you again. Um, well, in early 2025, when this legislation Indeed. is live. Thank Indeed. you. In real. Thanks. All the best. Yes. Thank you. Bye.